Eugene Williams Jr. is a talented and accomplished gentleman. And if I list some of his accomplishments, I can say writer, poet, actor, uh, educator, etc., 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 and the list goes on. But instead of that, I'm going to go right into our interview and allow us to meet him all the way. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Eugene, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come out and visit you. Thank and you um, uh, learn more about you and about the works and have an opportunity to share that with, with many people. Okay. Uh, certainly people at your school know you, but uh, maybe the community as a whole has not had that opportunity. Uh, I think the result of your work is an obvious uh, happening from your very earliest experiences. So let's begin at the beginning. Okay, well, um, I started my interest in writing started probably around second or third grade. My father was an educator. He's a retired educator. Uh -huh. He's now, um, he, he worked at Howard University in their school of education. He was a professor there for many, many years. And then he's a retired administrator in the D.C. public school system. My mother is a retired administrator in the Dade County public school system. Ah, so you, you were surrounded by yes. educational experiences so in your everyday life. That was, I was bombarded with, you know, that was not an option. We were reading all the time. <laughs> You know, we had, nowadays, kids can watch television as much as they want. I'm sure. not as stringent with my daughters as I should be about it either. But when I was coming up, we, you know, we had to spend at least three or four hours a day reading, talking about what we read, looking for new books, going to the library every week. So you know, my parents were kind of ahead of their time in terms of doing that, with, sure. not only with us, but the other kids in the neighborhood. They were very, they did a lot of outreach with everybody in the neighborhood. How many siblings do you have? Just me. Just you. So ah, that's why, so you, you know, got all of the yes, attention. Yes, and absolutely. And all of the encouragement. Absolutely. <laughs> sure is. Absolutely. That's fabulous. Um, so I was just, you know, I was surrounded by books. And so I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, with the talents that I felt I had. I, I was always just good at writing, even from an early age. And my teachers would always compliment me. So I kind of just wrote poems here and there as a hobby, as a way to just get my things out on paper and didn't really pay much attention. There's probably uh, hundreds of poems that I've written that I've thrown away by now that I've just never dealt with because they were, you know, I was four, five, six, seven, eight sure. years old. Um, but anyway, uh, when I was about four years old, my father's tax consultant came over to the house. This is, this is, this is a strange story. I've been reading since I was two and a half. Uh -huh. But my father's tax consultant came over to the house and he heard me reading one of the tax brochures. And he asked my father, he said, you know, well, I have a, a guy that I work with who's doing commercials. And he needs young kids, especially young minority kids. That was uh -huh. at the time when there was a big thrust for that. Sure. Who can read. So my dad asked me, you know, do you want to be on television? Do you want to try for a commercial? And I, <laughs> I was, you know, I was four years old. Sure, whatever, I'll do it. And I uh, went to this big studio in Silver Spring, Maryland, I remember it, and I auditioned for an Utz potato chip commercial. Ah. And I had to eat a whole bunch of potato chips and talk about how much <laughs> I loved it, you know, and rub my stomach, yum, yum, and all that. Um, and I, I, I got the commercial, and they needed a young lady to be in the commercial with me. They couldn't find anybody. So I happened to have a friend who was a next-door neighbor, so I asked her parents if she would do it. We were such close friends from, you know, a young age. Uh -huh. They agreed. So that was my first commercial. Apparently, somebody saw the commercial, and before I knew it, I was getting calls from New York, and the next commercial was a Sunbeam Bread commercial, and my third commercial was the first Jello Pudding commercial with Bill Cosby back oh in the uh, early beautiful. 70s. What was it like meeting Bill Cosby as a child? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it, it was intimidating, I think, more so for the parents and the kids. To him, sure. to us, he was just, you know, Bill Cosby, the guy we seen on Fat Albert, the right. different TV shows, what have you. <laughs> But to the parents, you know, he was more, he was that icon sure. that we think of. Sure. So they were, you know, well, don't, don't say anything to Mr. Cosby and do whatever he says and do whatever he, and, but he was just like a kid. You know, he kind of let us run with our own talents and do what we wanted to do and we had a lot of fun. It was a day long shoot, but I don't remember anything but laughing. That's all I remember, laughing all day oh, long. Bad. I don't know how we got the commercial done, but we spent most of the day <laughs> laughing, so. 
That's fabulous. Well, I think that the one commercial that I did read about, okay. though, besides the Jell-O commercial, was the Fruit of a Loom commercial. Yes. <laughs> that, that, that's an interesting <laughs> distinction to have. That was the commercial after the Jell-O pudding commercial. And uh, I played the Purple Grape. <laughs> Lovely. I was the original Purple Lovely. Grape <laughs> uh, in the Fruit of Loom commercials. And we were talking about the benefits of Lycra Spandex, I guess. And we were doing a back-to-school campaign. So, yeah, people still tease me, tease me about that. <laughs> well, not many people have that in their, uh, in their background. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Eugene, let me ask you also about the other things you did on television. You were in a soap opera? Right. Yes. I did Search for Tomorrow for a year. Uh, I was um, a black orphan. My name was Jamie Lawrence. And I was one of those transitional characters. They were trying to change uh, the villain at that time, who was the character named David, into a good guy. So they brought my character into his life to kind of reform him and change him, and he took care of me. And then when I left, he became the hero of the soap opera. So that was kind of my role. But I spent the first month of that year in a coma because the storyline dictates that he, that he hit me with a car. Oh, my. <laughs> and so I was in a coma for that Not many lines weeks. to learn. Not many lines to learn. There's a good, good way to make some money if you can get it. And um, then I, I moved on from there. But yeah, it was a really enjoyable experience because it taught me a lot about... Sure. The, the craft of acting, having to come in, not knowing what your script is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and learn the lines and learn everything you have to do within a, an hour or two before you shoot and then go out there that same day and do it. So it really kind of tests you as an actor. Yeah. Well, did you ever consider making acting a career? I did consider making acting a career. I had, I had done uh, several movies, um, you know, over the course of my career. I, uh, I've been on uh, local talk shows in Washington, D.C., um, hosted a show called In Our Lives, which is a local teen talk mm -hmm. show. Um, I did a movie with Ozzie Davis called The Man Who Loved the Stars. It was a uh, story about the life of Benjamin Banneker. Mm -hmm. um, I was the title role in the A.G. Gaston story, which was a, a small independent film about an um, African-American millionaire in the South. So I considered doing a lot of different things in, with regards to acting, but um, I, what I felt like was happening to me is as I was becoming more and more well known and doing more and more roles, my childhood felt like I was slipping away. Yeah. And I was missing out on a lot of things sure. or so I felt. My parents were always, you know, telling me if it ever gets to be too much for you, you're always welcome just to stop it at any time. And I thank them for that because they they really weren't stage parents. They were, in fact, you know, my mother especially was always like, okay, you sure you want to keep doing this every time we do something <laughs> next? Okay, because you can always stop. You can always stop. So I knew that if I decided to stop, that would be fine. You know. There would still be love in the house. It would still be, you know, Eugene and his parents. Sure.